Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Alex Titus. Welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge. As a mayor, it's my duty to work across the aisle. I am a very outspoken progressive. Anyone that's read my bio understands that, knows that about me. But that doesn't mean that we shut out every voice around us. Because one of the hardest things about post 9-11 veterans is the average American doesn't know someone serving in uniform. At our core, as a veteran, I believe that people have the right to say what they want. They have the right to do all of these things, but they are not free from the consequences of those decisions. And the fact that we constantly put things in the like left or right category is a challenge. All right, folks, uh, today we had another exciting interview, this time with the mayor of Beaverton, one of the largest cities in Oregon, uh, Mayor Lacey Beatty. Uh, Mayor Beatty is a fascinating figure in Oregon politics um, for a few reasons. So she actually started as a combat medic in the United States Army, and we talk about that in this episode and how 9-11 impacted her life. And we talk even a little bit on a broader level about foreign policy in the United States uh, of America's role in the world. Um, and then we actually eventually get to her role as mayor and local issues and the role of a city in addressing the most complex problems facing Oregon, uh, affordable housing in particular, and some of the innovative things that they're they're doing in Beaverton, and a proposal she has for the, the state legislature to take action. Um, so really enjoyed that conversation. Um, in terms of her background, she also has a background in public health. She used to work for Virginia Garcia. Um, she was a city councilor before she was mayor. She actually challenged an incumbent mayor, Mayor Denny Doyle, who um, just last week was arrested on child pornography charges. She primaried him. Uh, it's a nonpartisan race, but she's a Democrat and he's a Democrat and she took him on and won. Um, and she's, you know, she talks about in this episode, helping elect other people to local office who shared her vision uh, broadly on public policy issues. And she's she's seen as a sort of powerhouse in Washington County um, politics for her, her leadership and uh, her ability to influence decisions that are made. Um, so I'll keep it brief. Alex is unable to join the intro today. Um, but before you, we jump into the interview, if you haven't already, please remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. We're available on all podcast platforms. And uh, our popularity on YouTube is skyrocketing. Uh, I am only slightly exaggerating, um, but thank you to our producer, Buddy Terry, who edits our videos and puts them on YouTube. So if you haven't uh, checked us out on YouTube, you can see us there or Spotify, Apple, Google, Audible, anywhere podcasts are found. Um, we really appreciate your support and we hope you enjoy the interview with Mayor Lacey Beatty. All right, let's go. Mayor Lacey Beatty, Mayor of Beaverton, thanks for joining the podcast. How are you? You know, it's it's been a it's been a seventy two hours for people following Beaverton News. So, yeah, I'm surviving, yeah. and I'm here with you this morning. How's that for an answer? <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, we may get into some of that later, um, but before we do, we we usually ask like one background question. Um, and when I was reading your bio, like I think Alex will agree international affairs, foreign policy has been something that wasn't on a lot of people's radar until two or three weeks ago. And now all of a sudden feels like one of the most important things in the world. Um, and I saw in your bio that 9-11, September 11th, was a sort of defining moment in your life that kind of altered your trajectory in some ways. And I think for a lot of millennials, that was a moment that was super impactful for us. Can you tell us a little bit about how 9-11 changed your course in life? You know, it's interesting because I think when I was 17, when 9-11 happened and, and now at closer to 40, worldviews have shaped and been different. But my life was dramatically altered by 9-11 from a, a, a perspective of, you know, I went to war. And when I I grew up pretty poor and so joining the military was an option to pay for college. And it wasn't because I wasn't smart enough to get in. I was offered an NCAA lacrosse scholarship at UC Davis. And, um, but I didn't want to have student loan debt. And I knew I didn't want to have student loan debt. So the army seemed like a really great option. But when I thought about it, it was like, yeah, I'll go to Germany and drink beer and hang out and get out and go to college. And like, boy, how do you, was that not true? And so I think, you know, having experienced war and then coming back and I did college after my time in service and, you know, I have an undergrad in, in political science and discussing the invasion of Iraq from like a third party view as something I had lived through with 18 year olds at the time about, you know, being just 
really detailed focus on what they felt and perceived things to be, uh, it was challenging. And so I also am extremely patriotic. I think sometimes that word is weaponized right now um, on, on fringe sides of politics that somehow if you're like extremely patriotic, you are racist. Or if you're patriotic, you don't recognize uh, some of the systematic issues within it. Like, you know, uh, if you are uh, a Muslim American, your experience of 9-11 is vastly different than mine. Two things can be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that to me, like I am, I am patriotic to my core and that is what's led me through my public service career. And I've spent my entire adult life in service to others. And part of that is the idea that I know America, America can be better. And we are one of the best countries. That's not to say we don't have faults and I don't work, uh, vigorously to correct the faults of our past, but, you know, patriot, like patriotism came from my experience of 9-11. So uh, I think Alex is going to go more into your military service, but your your response makes me curious. So I'm trying to put I was I was in school uh, during 9/11, like elementary school. Um, but my understanding is when 9/11 happened, there was a short runway where like George W. Bush was the most popular president in American history. The the country was united against this threat of terrorism. Um, I think initially the the wars both in Afghanistan and Iraq enjoyed high approval ratings. And then of course it craters and um, there was poor planning. There was dishonesty from leaders. You're basically a college age kid at the time. Are you, when the war starts, are you feeling like I am going to serve my country and, you know, go get the terrorists? Or I think you were, you were a combat medic, right? Yeah. Um, so what, what was your, when you're in this moment, like, do you have an evolution of thinking or how are you processing like what's happening internationally? So I was 19 when I was in Iraq and we were there in 2003. And right before I deployed, um, I was stationed in Germany. I was sitting in a chow hall, like a, a place where people go to eat food, like a, a I don't know why I just totally blanked on the civilian cafeteria. term for that. A cafeteria. <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> Raid with somewhere else, uh, watching Donald Rumsfeld this uh, on TV say, we go to war with the army we have, not the army we want. Ooh. And that was a fundamental um, moment for me um, because as a woman, I went to war with gear that didn't fit me correctly. We had, uh, I drove an ambulance that was not up armored, like, right, that could, we had bullet uh, holes coming through us when we were driving through Baghdad, coming through the ambulance. We had, this is hard for people to imagine, when I was there, we had green vehicles because, like, they were Vietnam era vehicles that we oh had to God. paint while we were there. And we, I was driving a five ton, like a big pickup truck with a generator on the back, and we had um, sandbags in the front of the windshield to stop incoming bullets because they weren't up armored. But being a woman and, and a bit smaller, uh, you know, I'm only five, five, I couldn't see over the sandbag. So here I was telling the, the troop commander, the guy sitting next to me, hold the wheel so I could hang out this five ton window with a pocket knife and cut off the strap so I could kick the bags off the windshield because I couldn't see to drive the vehicle. Oh my God. Wow. And the fact in the gear, um, the body armor at the time had these like built in uh, neck pieces. So that way, if you got shot in the neck, but if you're a woman, you don't, most women don't have really long necks. So I had to take it out and run this risk. of when I turned to look out of the vehicle, I had this, I was exposed and now I've cut, I like, kicked the sandbag off the five tons so I could see out the window. And in my mind playing for a year is like, we go to war with the army. We have not the army we want. And a lot of my friends paid, you know, of course we've had friends that paid the act ultimate sacrifice while we were there but 20 years of sacrifice of brain injuries and losing limbs and, you know, mentally thinking about why we're there. And so it, it is really easy to go backwards and look and say, well, we should have, could have, or would have, but that wasn't the space we were in at the time. Yeah. Um, and I, I do want to ask you uh, a question about uh, as, as folks return home, but, but before I get to that, uh, I did want to ask because, uh, and we've talked about this a couple of times on our podcast, but I, personally think that in terms of uh, American politics, both from a foreign policy perspective, but also from a domestic policy perspective, that the Iraq and Afghanistan war are, uh, they're not underplayed issues and that folks talk about them a lot, but I honestly don't think that they get the importance 
uh, that they should when it comes to sort of defining how people feel about their political ideologies. Uh, I personally think that without the Iraq war, you probably don't get President Obama. And also without the Iraq war, you probably don't get President Trump. Uh, mm -hmm. You obviously, you know, served on the ground. Uh, you were a medic, which I know uh, sometimes folks talk about women don't serve in combat. But of course, as a medic, you are very much serving in combat because you're right there with everybody else who's in combat. Uh, would you mind uh, just kind of talking us through how did both serving and then kind of the aftermath of the war, how did that influence kind of uh, your, I, I, know that, I know that you describe yourself as a progressive. How do, how do you think that kind of determined or impacted your politics and kind of your political mindset today? Hmm. You know, what's interesting is I um, spent the last six months flying down to the George Bush Institute to work on issues around veteran issues. Now my 20 year old self, I don't think in a billion <laughs> years would be like, here you are all these years later, mayor of a city going to the George Bush Institute to work on veteran issues. And, and because I feel like as a mayor, it's my duty to, to work across the aisle. I am a very outspoken progressive. That is definitely uh, anyone that's read my bio or understands that knows that about me, but that, that doesn't mean that we shut out every voice around us. The interesting thing um, getting to meet the president was he's exactly what I thought he would be super funny, really personable. And um, one of the things that he said to me really shifted at this current juncture of my life, thinking a little bit, he said, you know, you're never judged by the decisions you don't make. Mm -hmm. So to your mm -hmm. point of, right, we, we got President Obama, maybe all these other aftermaths, we don't know, like we weren't judged by the decision that he didn't go there with mm -hmm. the intel that he had and what the world might look like after that point. And as a mayor now processing things, making decisions, it is challenging because you are not you are not defined by decisions you don't make. You only defined by decisions you do make. Um, and so I think that was that was challenging. But I also think he has this responsibility to to create the space to work on veteran issues because one of the hardest things about post 9-11 veterans is the average American doesn't know someone serving in uniform and we have completely farmed out um, our military service to people and I will tell you my husband's a full-time National Guard officer now I I honestly believe it's going to be harder and harder to get an all-volunteer military after 20 years of war, and then the shift towards how we're using the National Guardsmen and how we're responding to today's problems with the military that's on the ground today. And so I think because of my experience um, being in a foreign country, seeing war unfold, it's made me a lot more progressive. And I will tell you, it's most of my friends I served with are progressive people because at our core, as a veteran, I believe that people have the right to say what they want. They have the right to do all of these things, but they are not free from the consequences of those decisions. Mm -hmm. And in America, I want to raise my daughter in. I want her to marry who she wants, to be the kind of person she wants, all of those things. And I think those are in line with the American ideals. And the fact that we constantly put things in the like left or right category is a challenge. Yeah, that no, that that's that's definitely really interesting. Uh and yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I like how you said too, because I feel like sometimes people think, and you know, there's obviously been uh, like Tom Cotton, for example, right? He, well, obviously wasn't a nobody, you know, Harvard background, lawyer, et cetera, but he really got on the map because he wrote the, what was it the, uh, the letter to the editor while he was serving on the ground in Iraq, basically saying, uh, it's not going so great here. Here's what we should be doing. But uh, of course, as you said, when you're sort of in the moment like that, I, you're not you're not really thinking of those sorts of questions. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting to hear uh, your perspective, kind of more in the long term now, how you think it's defined your your political views and things like that. Uh, I did want to ask one more question to make sure that it didn't get lost. I think it's a really important issue. Would you mind kind of walking us through? Uh, uh, I would say, may, may, well, the rehabilitation process, but also like what happens when you're a veteran, you serve in this foreign war, uh, then you come back, you transition back to civilian life. Uh, what are the sort of resources that you're given? Or is there like a standard path there with the military? Uh, could you just kind of walk us through that? I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think when you're serving, you think the grass is greener. Like once I get out of this like regimented hellhole, my life will be <laughs> so much easier. But what they don't tell you is like how lonely it is. That that is the emotion mm. I experienced the most leaving the military was loneliness. 
and the fact that you, the military is great at like bringing people together around a mission or a flagpole, giving you purpose, structure. You know, I'm incredibly structured and detail oriented to this day because of my military service. I'm a really effective mayor because I could get up at 4 a.m. every day, ride my spin bike, answer emails, go to work when I don't want to do those things. Those are things that are not like inherent. You got to be taught and 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 taught those things. But when you leave the service, there is there is this you know a little bit of help, but it's mostly like bye, thank you for serving, have a nice day. And what mm-hmm. has had to spring up out of that void is veteran service organizations like Team Red, White, and Blue that notice you know it's not all about like not every uh, veteran has mental health crisis, but they're lonely. Let's bring people together in communities and work out together. You know, Team Rubicon brings together uh, military people and deploys them to natural disasters, not only in our own country, but other countries. Mm-hmm. They were the first people on the ground in, after the Haiti earthquake, because you have these skills and you have this ability to work together and understand a little bit of rank structure. So you could bring people from all over the country with a military background, dump them together and they could work together because within three seconds, We size each other up. We know what rank you had. We know what kind of job you have. We know what you're doing. And then boom, you can move forward and and walk in one direction. That is unlike any other kind of volunteer organization that that exists where people come together and they hem and haw and they're waiting to be told what to do. Like they're very functional and get going. My concern about the withdrawal of Afghanistan, which uh, I totally supported, but not in the way that we did it. I think we shouldn't be there and we shouldn't be in, in, the, in Iraq anymore either. And it was devastating to watch what had happened. But now there's going to be this like, well, we're done with war. We don't need to take care of veterans. So all these organizations that were getting money and government funding, I just had a meeting with a bunch of veteran service organizations last week that the, the funds are drying up. We've, we've we're closed this chapter, therefore... Why do we need to help veterans get jobs? Why do we need to help military spouses recover? You know, they're not going to war anymore. What's your problem? Just kind of get going. And so that is my fear is that now that we've shut the door on this service and who knows, you know, what's what's happening in Russia and Ukraine and what how that's going to impact us here. But I don't want that to be the end of our story. So I am fascinated by this conversation. There's a lot of different directions I want to take it. I think, so to your point, First, I loved hearing you use the term patriotic because I also feel patriotic and I feel like on the left, that is sometimes an uncomfortable thing that has connotations that are unintended. I also think that what is happening in Ukraine, and to put it more specifically, Vladimir Putin's expansionist war in Ukraine is going to require the United States to continue spending at high levels militarily. We've already seen countries like Germany who are doubling their military spending. Um, Ukraine's receiving military aid from countries that are traditionally um, neutral. You know, I guess rather than asking specifically about what you think about Ukraine, what do you think of, what do you think the role of the United States is on the global scale? Like, I feel like Joe Biden has taken us in a direction that I actually think is is spot on, which is basically like, we're not a unipolar power anymore. There's other, you know, China is a powerful country. Russia is a powerful country. They have nuclear weapons. They're um, engaging in activities that are uh, really awful, but it's not our job to unilaterally combat them. In fact, having a broad global coalition seems to be a lot more effective. That's a different approach than we t- we took in the early 2000s, for example. But I guess I'm curious, given how rapidly all of this is changing, how are you thinking about what the United States' responsibility is on the global stage? Well, I just, I want to preface that I am not a foreign policy expert. I just happen to be a local government official that serves <laughs> in the military. So uh, I just want viewers to understand that. I don't, I don't, um, I, I keep close circle with a lot of people and these are points of discussion. But my earlier point of being, I think we're on the brink of not being able to have an all volunteer force. We've asked extremely high uh, costs out of people that have joined the military. And then we have to constantly fight for, please take care of me. I mean, just today I was uh, looking at Facebook memories in bed before I woke up and it was during sequestration um, a couple of years ago. Some of the first programs they caught, they cut were uh, college money for veterans. And I was one of them. And so you know, we've asked you to do a lot of things and then we don't want to take care of you on the back end. So there has to be this realization that if we get engaged in global politics, we have a responsibility to take care of the people we've asked to do it. That is not, a, that, that is not shared across, that is not political. Republicans don't want to fund the VA just as much as 
veteran or uh, Democrats do it. And I think it stems a lot from not having people in power that have served and understand the sacrifice that they're asking. So knowing that we have uh, a, a force that has been 20 years of on and off war shifted to using the National Guard during COVID as this, this like really high tempo rapid response team that wasn't really designed to do that work. People don't want to continue to do this. Military spousal unemployment rate is 40%. And so they're asking people to leave, their spouse to leave. And these are highly educated uh, spouses often can't get jobs because you're moving every two to three years. And so the they're asking their, their partner to leave so they can have a career too, because families can't survive on one income, whether you're military or not. And so we have all of these things that we haven't fixed or addressed. And then we're looking at Ukraine and going, what do we do? So yeah, we need to be in there with partnership. We are not the world's superpower anymore, but it does create a vacuum. And so we have to agree with that. But um, when it's somebody else's kid you're asking to serve, I mean, that is a huge price. Like, you know, I, I texted our congressional delegation when this went off and just said, you know, make decisions like it's your own children. Look well, through isn't that, that, you know? I think I've read before, and you probably have more insight. I think you said you came from a, a low income background, but isn't that an increasing trend in the military, right? Like, like it's folks from low income backgrounds who are choosing the military because of the economic benefits, because of a sense of service for sure as well. But at the same time, you know, wealthy kids are not joining the military at nearly the rates of um, working class people, um, which I think is problematic. It's true. And I mean, there's the case like the Pat Tillmans of the world that served, uh, you know, in the NFL and then joined and, and have become, you know, folklore in the military and, and really built up as an amazing human, which he was and paid a huge sacrifice. But that is a unique story. You know, my husband, who just made the list for major, um, has been in 21 years. He was homeless in high school, couch surfing, looked like kids in Beaverton, worked, was working in a snowboard shop in Colorado when he joined and had, you know, and for him, it was upward mobility for both of us. It was college with no college debt, the ability to purchase our home with, with the GI Bill and, and being stable really for the first time in our lives of being able to do that. So there, there is benefits to serving, and I'm not discounting that. I think, you know, I can serve and have the job I have because I have a master's degree with no student loan debt attached to it, but it wasn't free. I paid a huge sacrifice to go to college on that money. Um, and so I think that that is the problem when we start looking at global, global things is like, this is not just a refilling um, source of people willing to do this work anymore. It's hard, it's isolating. And then, you know, I also want to make sure that like, there's also this connotation that if you serve, you're damaged. That is absolutely not true. There's lots of people that are not damaged. And um, so I think that too, the, the height of the Iraq war was that like, if you go, you're going to come back with a missing leg. And really, that's not true at all, but I think that's what generally people out there think. And we've made it, so we've put ourselves in a box that if you are a liberal, you have to be anti-military, anti all these other things. And that's those, those two, two things can exist. I mean, National Guardsmen were the one giving you your shot when COVID rolled out in Oregon, rescuing you off the mountain. You know, they're the ones that are out at sea, like the Coast Guard. Like those things don't have to be like, oh, like if you join the military, it's not just about war. It's about all these other things, but that is what's challenging. I know we've gotten a little off topic to your question here, but no, no, no. I think it's a really important factor for people listening to understand. If we want to continue to provide these resources, people have to join and be willing to serve. No, I totally, totally agree and appreciate the insight. Um, thank you for indulging us on the uh, foreign policy international scale, um, but you're also mayor of one of the largest cities in Oregon. Uh, so I'm going to do the worst transition ever and take us from Ukraine to housing. <laughs> and so I just I just read something where you that you had mentioned a couple of programs that you have in the city of Beaverton uh, on affordable housing. Um, we mentioned this a lot, but the Oregon Values and Belief Center have identified homelessness and affordable housing as two of the top three issues to Oregonians right now. And I think I think I read, I couldn't find the source, but I think I've actually read you talk about this in the context of generational wealth, which is also really interesting to me. So my two questions are one, can you talk a little bit about what are the programs that you have in Beaverton? And two, on the state level, what more do you need? I think the mayor's just sent a letter on this. Uh, what do you need from the legislature and the governor to make significant progress on what is certainly a crisis? 
All right, I'll try to do the rapid response here. <laughs> it is the number one fish if, uh, issue facing people in COVID has exacerbated it for sure. And, you know, when I was running for office, I talked a lot about my sister who is a server at Elmer's who by and large makes, you know, pretty decent money being a server, but can't afford to live in the city. And so she used to live in this apartment by Nike that was like 900 a month. And it was like 1100 and it was like 1200. It's a studio, by the way. And it got to the point where she's like, I can't afford to live here. So now she lives in um, past banks in Gales Creek and commutes in. And that is the trend of restaurant yeah. uh, worker service industry, people working at grocery stores. So like, I don't want to be the community that says, please come work here, but go home at the end of the day. Right. And that, that is un. I mean, just terrible for so many reasons, like schools and bringing kids together. And then we also are talking about it in the sense of transportation, right? Like if my sister who used to ride her bike to work, she wasn't at, like seriously rode her bike to work, had to buy a car because now she's commuting in. Now we're putting so much stress on our transportation system. And we don't talk about housing and transportation the same, but to me, they're like two sides of the same coin. We have to talk about both of them at the same time if we wanna like address some of the goals that we're having. So the city, you know, some of the things that we're doing around affordable housing was, uh, you know, I worked 40 years ago getting four women elected to our special district park to deal with affordable housing. And people would be like, what is that? Why? <laughs> well, when we're, when we're building affordable housing, we have something called an SDC, a system development charge that we put on, you build, and it is to build the infrastructure around you, parks, sidewalks, streetlights, all those things. It's necessary for communities like ours to do that so we can build the infrastructure that goes along with it. Well, that makes affordable housing really expensive. And most affordable housing projects can't get built on less than $100,000 because they, the bridge financing, how much harder it is to get financed in affordable housing. And so when we looked at our system development charges, we realized that our special district park were 33% of that charge. That represents millions of dollars in an apartment complex, just so you know. And so I went to their, their board and was like, hey, partner with us, we waive our fees. Now come in and waive your fees. And so we can do this together as a toolbox. And they, the board at the time was like, no, it's not our job to deal with affordable housing as if it was like somebody else's problem. Right. So I worked an entire summer getting four women elected just to do this one tiny fix, which was get system development charge fees waived from our special district park because we didn't control them. And we did that. And it represented like 55 units of housing being built. So th that's how hard it is to address affordable housing, that it's not one size fits all. And it takes all of this fit to work together. Of course, the Metro bond that voters passed here in the Portland Metro region meant that we were able to get four complexes built in Beaverton and fast. We wouldn't have been able to do those projects on their own but it's a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. So we have this going on property tax mm -hmm. revenue. We're trying to fix it. And then we're trying to solve in your community, Ben, this issue, uh, your community is going to have the first where it's been subsidized for 20 years. And now it's going to, it's dropping off the rolls. So the people that own it can sell it for market rate, taking that affordable housing market that exists and turning it over to somebody. And a lot of people 20 years ago, invested going, well, in 20 years from now, I'm, I'm not going to make any money over these next 20 years, but I'm going to cash out and sell it. Now we're paying the piper for that. And it's going to start happening more and more. So that's happening. Land, we have the urban growth boundaries happening. And so it makes it really challenging. And in the middle of that, here I am saying, we need to talk about generational wealth. My family's trajectory is changed because of home ownership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do yeah. that because we didn't have to put a down payment. And the state of Oregon has a special program for veterans that our interest rate is 2%. That maximizes our buying power in a market like this. And so I, I, I wrote a letter to the future governors and I've talked to all the major candidates of like, if we could do this for veterans, is there a way for us to do it for first generation home buyers? Like, you know, if we've had this successful program and I'm not saying it, uh, like everyone fits in this category, but can we do that? And then the other thing we have to look at, at that is, you know, can we, you know, we only think about three bedroom, four bedroom houses. Can we build condos that look like apartments, which don't really exist here, where it's maybe 150,000 and much easier to buy into. And so yes. it's a spectrum of doing it. And I just went all over the place. So yeah, we're working on affordable housing, home ownership. <laughs> it's like, and I think it's doable if we bring people in the room and have the conversation, like it's not that challenging. We did it for veterans. We can do it for other people. Real quickly, Alex, sorry, Alex. Um, yeah. That is super interesting. 
so when you say we've done it for veterans, you're talking about locking in this super low interest rate or are there other provisions that make it easier? Uh, it's that particularly interest rate and the fact that you don't have to put 20% down. So you don't have mm. to pay. Um, it's a government backed loan so that you don't have to have mortgage insurance. So with a lower interest rate, no mortgage insurance, and then not having to put all of that money down, your purchasing power is greater. Now there is, and maybe, you know, and I'd be interested on Alex's uh, thought on this as the conservative in this three-way conversation here, but I think people are generally okay with veterans having that because they feel like it's an earned benefit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge fan of compulsory service, whether like it doesn't have to be military, it could be something else. So if we're talking about this, it doesn't just have to be a program people can just have access to. Could we create you know, a program where you're working in nursing homes or giving back to the state? And at the end of this, you have access to this kind of loan. I love that. Alex, either defend yourself or agree with us. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. There was a... Uh... Uh, and I forgot who said this at one point, but they were, you know, uh, sort of making fun of all their conservatives for uh, bashing on young people for not liking capitalism or whatever, which of course <laughs> they do all these polls. Uh, you know, you can make a poll, basically say whatever you want. But the person said, yeah, of course, because they don't actually have any capital. Uh, and they said that and it got me thinking, I was like, yeah, there's a decent amount of millennials who are, you know, in their forties now uh, and they don't own anything. And of course, like, as you said, with the generational wealth, uh, owning a house is one of the most secure ways to at least, again, it's not going to make you wealthy. It might not even pay for your retirement, but obviously that will help quite a bit. So uh, yeah, no, I think it's a, it's definitely a really interesting idea and something to explore further. And we talk about affordable housing all the time on this podcast. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's such an interesting issue because it feels like there's uh, there's no actual like conservative view of it or progressive view. There's kind of a little bit of both. Uh, so yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's an interesting idea at least that, that there's the Oregon with, bridge in action for you, Ben. There you go. <laughs> and we're going to work with Ben. Like this is going to be a bill he carries because he heard it here first, but uh, I, that's exactly. So uh, my district does actually, if, if I'm successful, will include, you know, Southridge high school, progress Ridge, et cetera. So Mayor Beatty will be uh, one of my mayors. Um, but Alex, sorry. You I and everyone you. else, man. Just, <laughs> yeah, you probably got like that. eight. I have like, like, <laughs> got like 20 of you now. So. I was going to say, you're you're texting your congressional, the congressional delegation. You're going to have like 15 legislators say, <laughs> texting yeah. you. Like, <laughs> sorry, Alex, I uh, I stole your thunder, but you should go to your question. Oh, no, it, it's okay. And yeah, we, we were running a little bit short on time. Uh, I do want to ask you a little bit more of a philosophical question. And uh, it's sort of kind of the basis of it is what you think the the role of the city is versus the role of the state legislature or the governor or whatever. And let me let me kind of tee that up for you a little bit. Uh, so one example I would say, and we had Stan, Mayor Stan Pulliam on this podcast before, and of course he uh, you know, was one of the first mayors, at least in Oregon, to say, we're not doing a mask mandate here, businesses are staying open. Uh, that was obviously Stan sort of saying, I should be able to make the rules when it comes to this issue. Uh, but I mean, take that like a little bit further. Like, I'm sure that there are some areas where you think either the state legislature or the governor isn't doing enough. You say, we need more investment in affordable housing or we need this. But then there's probably some areas where you think maybe there's mission creep in terms of like this top-down approach clearly isn't working. Beaverton wants to go at this our own way because that's what's going to work for us and we're on the ground and we think this is going to work better. Uh, so I'm kind of curious, you know, uh, like, what do you think broadly, I guess, that, that kind of like that, that difference is, or like, where is that, where's that kind of good middle ground? That's uh, super funny, because I feel like I talk about this all the time. Look, I am not a local control for local control sake mayor by any stretch, like maybe Mayor Stan is, but um, for me, that definitely there's areas where it's highlights where it works and it doesn't work. So I, I will tell you this, if we voted based on what was most important to you and impacted your life the most, it would be your mayor and your school board and your county commission at the top. And it would be the president and the state legislature, no offense, Ben, but like you <laughs> yeah. came from the good side, like the local <laughs> school board. So you know what I mean? And I, I always say like mayors lead through crisis and the state legislature fixes it after the case, after the fact. So I'll tell you this example, this happened this summer. I, my phone starts blowing up social media when the heat dome hit that residents were being asked that were renters to take the air conditioning unit out uh, uh, because it violated the codes of their um, lease. Now, when I went to our code compliance and said, what can we do? I mean, it's 115 degrees, like clearly like people are literally dying in housing. We shouldn't be asking people to take air conditioning out. 
there was no state law that gave you the protection to cool air like heating. Because honestly, in Oregon 20 years ago, I mean, you didn't need it. When I moved here in 20, 2007, you didn't need air conditioning. And so we didn't have any, the only tool in my toolbox was to call and go, yo, I'm the mayor, please do this. Next time I won't be asking by myself, maybe it will be with a news outlet. Like let's fix this problem on the ground. And so I went to the state legislature, I pulled together a summit on this topic and brought in lawmakers and said, here's the problem, help me fix it. And so we worked, uh, Senator Jama and Representative Marsh carried that bill and fixed the problem. That doesn't mean like it's solved forever, we have some other work to do, but that was one example where I didn't have the tools in my toolbox, the state legislature needed to fix it. Mm -hmm. And we had to work together to get through it. Um, and it's kind of messy, but so we have to have really good partnerships to go, hey, this is a problem. This is what I'm seeing. I need you to solve it. And cities are like the incubation hub of ideas and creativity. We're the closest to the people. We understand what the problems are. And you know, if you took me and the state rep in a grocery store, I think they would notice me the mayor more. And that's not like a gig, that's just like the kind of job and we're in the, we're in the community. And so we have to be closest to the people and trust everyone to do it. Now, public health, like I'm a, like I'm a public health background. I worked in Virginia Garcia as a medic. We should have been wearing a mask at the very least. Like that is the most patriotic thing you could have done. World War II Americans would look at us and be so angry the people that gave up you know, meat and leather and did victory gardens and gas and turned their lights off at night, all for this common good of helping another human. Here we are all these years later being like, oh, I'm not gonna wear a mask to protect you. Not that I intended to go down that, that trend on this podcast, but we gotta do things for other people. So I do think we need a level of government that regulates and understands you know, public health crisis. But I, wanna be, I don't wanna be left out of the conversation because I have information they have. So. When I ran for office, I talked a lot about the need for partnership and relationship building. And there is no shortcut to relationship building. I do all, like I, my entire life, it's nothing but relationship building, mostly with other electeds to get things done and accomplished. And they don't always do what I want, which is sad. Uh, but <laughs> I, they answer the phone and we do good work together. And I think you can't be a mayor and be like, you know, all by yourself. You need all these levels of government working together, but you have to put in the effort to build relationships to get things done and accomplished. So um, for, for our final question here, um, I want to preface this by saying I'm not trying to dunk on anyone or like, you know, but a couple of very weird things have happened <laughs> and uh, you have been at least tangentially related to them. Um, the first was- I, I love how you teed up that question. That was, that was... <laughs> so she, probably, she knows exactly where I'm going to, I'm sure. So the first is, so the former head of the League of Oregon Cities, a guy named Mike Coley, um, there was some weird stuff that happened on Twitter that ultimately ended up with him losing his job. And you were like strangely in the middle of this. Can you explain what happened? And is there a backstory to that that makes it make more sense? Or was that just like a, a very weird thing to you as well? Like what, what happened? Well, I think when we talk about economic recovery and like in economics in our city, in our state, it's really important to know there are influential people that you didn't vote for and you know that are having massive influence into the way we do things here. The Oregon League of Cities is the lobbying arm for all 200 plus cities in Oregon that go into the legislature that have immense power and influence to um, you know, lobby behind the scenes on bills. So to have the head of that organization in one tweet during a global pandemic say, I don't tip people. And if you want a better job, go to college as if every system in the world was just that easy. Like I went to war to pay for college. Like this is not an accessible thing. Plus serve, like just three months ago, we were talking about service workers as heroes that worked during a global pandemic, nothing has changed. It's still dangerous. And here you are like, make your food at home, buddy. Um, and so when I was looking at that on Twitter, like I just, I couldn't believe it. And I, I was a little bit shocked. And so like he clearly deleted it, but I had screenshotted it and I sent it back out because I wanted people to know. And I, I didn't think it would land in ending his job. And I would, I think here's, and if you read the article, you know, he started sending me DMs, calling me horrible names. And that is why he lost his job. Now, if he had right. called me and said, hey, mayor, I had this just like really weird experience. I threw it up on Twitter without thinking. I deleted it because I know it was the wrong thing. And I just had this moment. I would have deleted my tweet. 
But that is not what he did. He doubled down and then started attacking people on Twitter. And so I had to like get up the next morning and kind of go, you know, I'm the mayor of one of the largest cities. I'm never going to feel welcomed at an event again if he is the executive director. So I wrote to the board and they acted swiftly. But I will tell you, if this was the board of five years ago, they probably wouldn't have fired him. That's what it's like being a woman leader. Um, and so there wasn't, no, it's just that's, I mean, and that's why it's really important. You know, some of the most powerful positions in government are not ones you elect. They're people that are serving on boards and commissions. They're the city managers. They're the staff of legislatures that like transcend multiple legislators. Um, and so we have to really think about who we're empowering in those positions because they have a lot of influence. I really appreciate you telling that. There's a lot of leadership lessons embedded in that story for people. Um, and I think what I, I what I liked about that story was... First of all, it just seems super weird, but I, I, you were, you were willing to uh, be unpopular with potential. I don't know if this guy was popular with, oh, but I assume popular. Yeah. Yeah. But you were willing, you called him out and, and you actually called him out on the policy that he was initially, like, it was actually like calling him out on this ridiculous, like servers sh shouldn't get tips statement. And then it got weird from there. Um, but I wanted to talk about that in part because like you talked about relationship building, but it's relationship building when necessary, but it's also, you know, when you ran for mayor, you were running against incumbent uh, and an incumbent who's now in the news, which I don't think we really need to go there. Um, but it was the right thing to do uh, in your view. And you, you know, you could have tried to build a relationship with him as a counselor and you probably did while you were a counselor, um, but ultimately made a different choice when the election came. So I just thought it was an, an interesting uh, insight into probably how you how you see the world. Um, well, with that, we've reached the end of our interview, but our final question is always, if someone heard something and they wanna follow up with you because they got a question or they wanna follow your work in the city of Beaverton, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you or to follow your work? So I was always the elected official that made, I was the only elected official in Beaverton for years that had my email address public on the web, city website. Now I make everyone do it because I'm the mayor, but so you can <laughs> find me, it's really easy. You could follow me on Twitter at Lacey Beatty um, and, you know, on social media channels. I'm also, uh, we have a constituent link. If you reach out to me, we, we do calendar. I do four hours a week of constituent time. So if you want to have a 15 minute conversation with me, you could just plug in and, and find some time to chat and meet. And it's either the best part of my week or worst part. It just depends on who shows up. So, but I think if it's your listeners, it'll be great and interesting. So if it's my listeners, great. If it's Titus's listeners, awful, just absolutely awful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that, Ben. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, all right. Well, Mayor Beatty, thank you again for coming on the podcast, and uh, we'll see you all later. Thank you.